All right, well, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, first talk of the day, we have Jonathan, who's going to tell us, is the Raspberry Pi Pico a computer? Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much. OK, yes. So this is a, a variation of a talk um, I've given previously. I, I used to have a different title, and I, I used to call it, uh, gave it the name of my project and said, oh, let's talk about ARM and Rust and microcontrollers. And then it turns out what I actually really wanted to talk about was the history of computing. And some people came to my talk, and they were disappointed that there wasn't much ARM and there wasn't much Rust. And I'd spent basically an hour talking about the IBM System 360. So I've revised the title, and what we're going to talk about is, is the Raspberry Pi Pico a computer? You may have some preconceived notions. We're going to get into that discussion. We're going to need to talk about what is a computer. So who am I? While I do embedded systems for my job, uh, I teach the Rust programming language um, and yeah, help, help companies with their, with their Rust projects. I have a wide and varied background. I've done yeah, these languages, C++, Python, Pascal, Basic, done a bit of pick assembler in my time, done all sorts. But Rust is where I've ended up and for very good reasons. I find it a very enjoyable language, very powerful language. Um, but I would say that because I sell training. So don't believe me, have a look and see what's online. Ferris Systems is the company I work for. Yes, that is a Rust-based pun. Everything in the Rust ecosystem is a Rust-based pun. You can find all of my source code on uh, GitHub. And I used to have a Twitter link, but since the whole thing with Twitter, uh, I'm now on Mastodon. So you can find me on Mastodon there. So here is our question. Is the Raspberry Pi Pico a computer? Which, and I had to think to answer that. The first question is really, what is a computer? And once we sort of defined what a computer is, we'll then see how the Raspberry Pi Pico fits against that. So I've picked some examples of computers from history. And then we'll hopefully agree that, yes, these are probably computers, maybe. I think I've thrown one on the list that you might go, oh, I don't know. So IBM System 360, big kind of 1960s mainframe. You know, we'll see some pictures. That's a computer. We're going to look at the Altair, a little sort of 70s machine with the flip switches on the front. The original IBM PC, sort of the granddaddy of all the PC compatibles. We'll look at the Commodore Amiga and then the iPad. Hmm, is the iPad a computer? And to compare and contrast these machines, we're going to talk about different aspects. So let's talk about their processing power. Let's talk about the memory they have. Let's talk about how they interact with the real world. And I think this is something that's key when it comes to talking about whether something is a computer. Let's look at the storage mechanisms they've got, how they can remember data. And what I think is, comes down to the crux of what it is to be a computer is can I run my code on it? I like to think of it this way. Can I enter a room with me and the computer and get the computer to do something novel that I've only just thought of? For me, I think that's what it, what it comes down to. So. The IBM System 360 Model 30, there was a whole bunch of models in the range, uh, released in 1965-ish. You know that modern, uh, the modern failure of software development, right? Software is late and it is buggy. You noticed that recently, that software just doesn't seem to be shipped on time. The operating system for the IBM System 360 was late and it was buggy and they had to ship two interim other operating systems in the meantime because they couldn't get it to work. So not a new phenomenon, it's just software engineering is difficult. This machine, um, we'll go through the specs a bit later, but the, the processor runs at one megahertz. I say processor, the processor is the cabinet on the left hand side, that whole thing that's like the processor. The processor is not a chip. This machine predates chips. The processors are going to be multiple circuit boards put together. We have some disk drives on the right. We have some magnetic tape on the left. And then in the front, we have a teletype, 
And I think that's, that's a key feature. I think these disk drives are about five megabytes each, which in 1965 is pretty good going. But given the machine cost, you know, probably $150,000 in its base specification in 1965 money, yeah, it should be, should be pretty good. Let's move on and look at the Altair. Anyone ever used an Altair before? So uh, yeah, pretty, pretty nice machine. We're talking 1975. And this was one of the first examples of a computer you could build yourself. Um, in terms of input and output, well, the machine doesn't have like a ROM. You know, you turn a computer on and it does something before it loads the rest of the, the stuff from disk. This machine doesn't have one. To enter the first software that it runs on startup, you have to use the toggle switches. And you set the toggle switches to specify an address, and you press a button to say latch address, address, I don't know, zero. And then you adjust the toggle switches to set the byte of uh, data you want to put in that address. And then you press store. And then you go back and you change the addresses and you go through. And then once you've loaded sort of about 10 or 12 different bytes into the memory, that's then enough to teach it how to load the rest of the software in, um, which generally came from paper tape. Microsoft's first ever product was basic for this computer. And they developed it all. They didn't have the computer. They used a, a simulator running on a mainframe. And then they flew over to where the, the first prototype Altair machines was. And they took the tape with them. And they entered the instructions. And they loaded the tape. And it worked first time, which I think is pretty impressive. Is it a computer? Well, I think it needs a few more bits and pieces to go with it. But you can write software for it. You can load it from tape. So I think computer. The IBM PC, the grandfather of all PC compatibles. This one's a bit fancy because it's got two disk drives. You can see the, the black units at the bottom there. Disk drives were optional with the IBM PC. Does anyone know what you would do with your PC if you didn't buy the optional disk drives? Well, you could type in your program, yeah, but how would you save it? What would you do if you'd bought yourself a Sinclair ZX81 or a Commodore VIC-20 from about the same kind of time? I've typed it wrong. 1892, that's a bit, that's a bit early, 1982. Well, as with other machines in the early 1980s, you would use a cassette deck with an audio tape. All of the original IBM PCs have a socket on the back labeled cassette. And if you couldn't afford the disk drives, you loaded and saved your programs from cassette tape. And it had basic built in. So if you turned it on and there were no disk drives, you got a basic prompt, just like a Commodore 64 or a ZX Spectrum or a machine like that, which everybody's forgotten about, right? Because everybody ordered the optional disk drives because tapes were terrible. Um, and everybody ordered it with Microsoft DOS, which is what made Microsoft into the powerhouse they are today. There's lots of apocryphal stories you can read online about how Microsoft got the contract to make the operating system for this computer. Um, many people will say, oh, well, IBM were going to go to digital research because they made CPM and CPM ran on machines like the Altair. Um, and for various reasons, digital research didn't agree. And so Microsoft was supplying the basic, because Microsoft did the basic for the Altair. And IBM said, well, you're doing our basic. Do you have an operating system? And Microsoft said, yes. Yes, we have an operating system for your PC. No problem at all. And then they immediately turned around and went, where can we buy an operating system from? And they went out and bought one. They licensed it for not very much money. And then went to IBM and said, here, here is an operating system we have for you. And that was the, the first version of MS-DOS, MS-DOS version one. Does anyone know what a base spec IBM PC came with in terms of memory? Six, 8K. 8K, a little bit more, 16K was like your minimum IBM PC, yeah. You think of PCs as having 640K. Yeah, no, that was, that was a fully, fully stacked out machine from, from later on. The early ones, you could have as little as 16, I think most people went with 64K. 
it's, it's funny, right? We think of the PC as being this sort of powerful machine, but really, it was just another 1980s computer like a Commodore 64, like a ZX Spectrum. But somehow this one caught on and we're still stuck with the technology today. This laptop is a Dell laptop and it still has like keyboard controller and various interfaces that look like the PC. Is that a question? Uh, it is an Intel uh, 8088. So it's not even an 8086, it's the cheap cut down version with the 8-bit bus because 8-bit uh, boards were easier to make. It also cost $1,500 and didn't have as much RAM as the C64, which was only $600. Let's move on a little bit in time. A computer, so many, I see some nods, yeah, people have fond memories of their Commodore Amiga. So it's incredible how fast things moved in the 1980s and the 1990s. The PC was four, about four and a half megahertz. The Commodore Amiga, we had a, a Motorola 68000, a much more advanced processor, and it ran at more like eight megahertz, and we've got 512K of RAM. But it, it's a computer, right? Keyboard, monitor, we're familiar with this kind of idea, what computers look like. And then we're going to look at some specs in a minute. So I thought just to sort of frame the specs, we'll take my work laptop. This is a picture from Wikipedia, but I every day use an Apple MacBook with an M1 Pro. Um, it's going to be interesting, right, to see the kind of performance relative to those computers. Well, that leads us to the question, how much performance do you need to have to be a computer? Well, we agreed the IBM was a computer and it ran at about 0.03 million instructions per second. So about 35,000 instructions per second. It ran at one megahertz, but the problem is when your processor is multiple circuit boards spread across a cabinet, it takes a number of clock cycles to get data from the registers, which are like on one card down here, to the arithmetic unit, which is on another PCB somewhere else. So you think of sort of, Computers in a cluster and transferring information over a network. That's sort of how the early processors worked. They were just different cards joined together with lots of wires. So one megahertz, but it took a lot of clock cycles to do anything. So you only end up with that kind of performance. The Altair actually has a processor on a chip. It's powered by the Intel 8080, 10 times faster. 0.3 million instructions per second, but it's good enough, right? And if you've played with an RC2014 kit, similar kind of chip, similar kind of levels of performance. The IBM PC, not a lot quicker, to be honest, same kind of speed. So we think computers, they don't have to be that fast. The Amiga, bit of a step forward, 1.4 million instructions per second, running at about eight megahertz. Does anyone want to guess what kind of numbers we're talking about for the MacBook? 7,000. 7, Do I hear any advance on 7,000? It's like an auction. <laughs> well, so this is all the cores together? 32,000. Any advance on 32,000 million instructions per second? That is eye-wateringly fast. Well, the answer is best as I can estimate is more like 200,000 million <laughs> instructions per second. These old computers, right? So the Amiga, eight megahertz, 1.4 million instructions. So it's taking sort of about four clock cycles to do anything. The modern processors, certainly very advanced ones like the, the ones Apple are producing, can execute eight, 10 instructions per clock cycle because the processors themselves are so wide, they can, do lot, they can do lots of different arithmetic on different numbers at the same time, and then the computer just has 10 of them, and they're clocked at around three gigahertz. So, staggering levels of performance, not necessary to be a computer, I don't think, because the old, slow machines, that was a computer. Let's look at the memory. System 360, you could get that with various amounts of memory, 64K was kind of normal. The Altair, only 1K of RAM. And if you wanted to run BASIC on a paper tape, you needed two 4K upgrade cards, because BASIC used quite a bit of RAM. 
But I suppose if you were entering numbers by toggling switches, by the time you'd entered a thousand individual numbers into the computer, you were probably getting pretty tired. So 1K of RAM was probably fine. Yeah, so we say the original IBM PC, 64K was kind of a normal level. The Amiga, 512. The MacBook, 16.8 uh, million K of RAM. And that's not even really a lot. You can buy a workstation with, with more than that. Let's talk about input and output, because I think this is a key feature of what makes a computer a computer. So where do you draw the boundary? What is the computer and what is the terminal? So the, the IBM mainframe and the Altair had this idea that the computer itself just had a sort of a connector on the back that said, plug terminal in here. The computer itself couldn't display text and it couldn't get input from a human. It had to rely on a terminal to do it. Uh, we think maybe these days terminals as being screens and keyboards. Well, they don't necessarily have to be. Your terminal can be a printer. So imagine this, youngsters in the audience, using a computer where everything the computer shows you does not appear on a TV screen, but instead is printed in ink on paper. So if you make a mistake, it's tough. It's on the paper, it's done. So you imagine writing, uh, writing a program, it's all on paper. You want to list it again, more sheets of paper. Here is an example of someone playing the game Wordle on, a, on an ASR 33 teletype. But it works, right? You can run what you consider to be a computer program through this kind of interface. A program does not have to be something you see on a screen. It can be, um, you know, words written out on paper. And so I think when we say these computers have serial interfaces, really we have to bring the terminal along with it, whether it's a teletype that prints onto paper or whether it's one of those fancy video display terminals that used a TV screen and put the words on the TV screen. Because that's, I think, what you need. If you go into the room and get the computer to do something novel, you need the human interface with it. Otherwise, it would be more like an embedded system, right? The little microcontroller in your coffee machine, probably not a computer, because if I go into a room with the coffee machine, I can't get the coffee machine to do something novel. It doesn't have a little keyboard. I can't give it new instructions for making different coffee. It has a job to do, and it does it. Yeah, yeah, and it, it, it has a lot of overlap with, with, um, with computers. So we, these embedded systems often use computing technology in them, but the fact that they are limited in what they are able to do and they don't have this mechanism for human input, I think, is what stops them from being a computer. So the IBM PC and the Amiga 500, they went away from the idea of uh, teletype terminals or, or visual display terminals and it's all integrated. We saw with the Amiga, it has a keyboard and you plug it into your TV. Still a computer, but now it's all sort of integrated in the box. And that's what's with us today. MacBook, you get a screen, you get a keyboard. Let's talk about storage. What kind of storage do we need to be a computer? Well, I guess you just need some mechanism of taking the numbers that are in memory and putting them somewhere so you can get them back later. System 360 was using magnetic tapes. So I think it's probably eight inch, eight, one eighth of an inch or one quarter of an inch tape on big reels. And then there's a little read write head and the computer can spin the tapes around to scan, scan through. But that worked, right? You could save data to tape and you could load data back in again. I think half inch tapes we were using there. Yeah, half inch tapes, yes. That makes sense. And on a modern computer, if anyone used a, used a Raspberry Pi, you've used Linux, you've used the tar command, right? You download tar balls from the internet and we say tar and we unpack them and you can make new tar balls and send them to people. Does anyone know what tar stands for? Tape archive. Tape archive. That is the format that was used on a Unix machine to write to actual magnetic tape. And later on, someone went, well, we already have this format for writing to tape, so I guess we could just save it to disk. So it's interesting how these ideas from, from early computing are still with us and still get used today. 
So the System 360 was on magnetic tape. The Altair, as we said, loaded programs from paper tape. Um, much harder to write software onto paper tape. You need a puncher. You need a machine that can actually punch the holes in the tape. You could also plug disk drives in, um, probably an 8-inch uh, disk drive. The PC, if you got the optional upgrade, came with 5 and a quarter inch disks. The Amiga 500 was on 3 and a half inch disks. So we're storing 720K of data. That's if 512K of memory in the computer, and you could store slightly more than that on the disk. Uh, my MacBook, we said 16 gigabytes of RAM, and then the storage is, I think, what, 100 times the RAM? I can't remember how much storage. It's about 1,000 gigabytes, I think, I have in a, in a MacBook. But these days, we don't use disks. We use what's called flash memory. It's a special kind of memory that can remember its contents after it's been powered off. So we used to have to use these. Eight inch disc on the left, that is a floppy disc. The one in the middle is a mini floppy. That is the small one because it's smaller than the eight inch one. So that's your mini floppy. And then your micro floppy is on the right hand side. Um, memorialized for reasons no one really remembers as the save icon in you know, all kinds of Windows programs. Um, yeah, it's funny how these things stick with us. And they were rigid, not floppy. Yes, and they're not even floppy, right? They're this solid, hard plastic. Not shown the three inch that I use in my Amstrad. Quick quiz question for people. How much data can you store on a three and a half inch high density disc? 1.44 is absolutely the wrong answer. No, it's double 720 because the standard format versions were 720 and these are double. And 2 times 720 is 1,440. But it's binary kilobytes. We were measuring in 512 byte blocks. So it is 1,440K, where K is the binary K. You can't divide that by 1,000, just put a full stop in. That's not how binary numbers work. Someone at some advertising company at some point, when I'm not writing 1440 in the advert, that's too long, I'll just put a decimal point in. And everybody's stuck with it. But it's wrong. If you divide it by 1024, you get about 1.39. I guess it's just not as catchy. It's funny how these things stick with us. And how some of us are of a disposition that we continue to be angry about them <laughs> 30 years after the fact. I see YouTubers. Um, and I'm straight in the comments. I'm like, it's not. I mean, you can call it a 1.44 if you want. It just isn't. Questions, can I run my code on these computers? Yes. I think any one of these computers, given a sufficiently good book, I think I would need a book to help me program a System 360. I would definitely need a book to program the Altair. A PC comes with basic, fine, yeah, an Amiga, C compiler or whatever. But these computers, I can use them to write my own code. If I go into this um, hypothetical room with me and the computer and a book, I can run my code. So the iPad. Is the iPad a computer? Well, we look at the specifications. It's very fast. It's got a ton of RAM. And then, you know, these are from the, the, the first version of the iPad. We have a touch screen, right? That's input. You can put a, a keyboard on the screen. We've got storage, just like the MacBook. So is it a computer? And I think once upon a time, I might have given you this talk and said no, because you can't program an iPad. Apple famously didn't like having programming languages available in the App Store. And they famously still don't like you loading your own software that's not from the App Store. And if I have to write the code on my laptop, upload it to the App Store and have it approved, and then buy it on my iPad and download it, you know, I can't do this within the hypothetical closed room. I have to bring something else with me. However, as part of the research for this, I found that Apple released a product called the Swift Playground. And they now want people to write programs in the Swift programming language to make apps for the iPad and for the iPhone. And you can write the Swift code 
on your iPad. And you can actually make an app and you can publish it to the App Store all from your iPad. So is the iPad a computer? I think the answer was no when it first came out. And I think Apple have since relented. And I think now I would call the iPad a computer. So we have some sense now, I guess, of what, what I think a computer is. And you can decide for yourselves what, what makes a computer. So the other part of our question, is the Raspberry Pi Pico a computer? We've covered the computer. Well, let's talk about what the Raspberry Pi Pico is. And it is just a circuit board with a microcontroller on it. And what do we mean by a microcontroller? Well, it's a chip that basically contains everything that Altair had in it. So that Altair had a bunch of different expansion cards. There was a processor card, a memory card, and an interface card, and there'd be some kind of clock circuitry card. Well, a microcontroller has all of these cards just built in to a single piece of silicon. You sometimes hear the phrase system on chip. That's what I mean. It's a whole computer system on a single chip, um, which makes them very low cost, very easy to integrate because you can just solder it down and it does everything all inside. I don't have to wire up you know, the 8-bit interface to my memory and then run the 8 wires over to the ROM and then I need 16 or 20 address wires. Look at an RC2014 kit and you'll see the circuit board has lots of wires joining everything together. There are advantages to making those wires inside the chip. So what is the, the microcontroller we have on the Pico? Well, it is the Raspberry Pi RP2040. It's not the catchiest name, but all right, we'll, we'll go with it. And what do you get? Well, you get two processor cores. So it's like a dual processor system. I'm old enough to remember the late 90s when a colleague had like a dual processor workstation to do CAD. That was considered like a really fancy, powerful thing. Nowadays, that costs 75 cents. You get 264K of RAM, which is a lot for a microcontroller and definitely enough to be a computer, right? It's four times or eight times as much as your, your sort of early PCs came with. It's half what the Amiga came with. So if we made a computer, then it's probably not going to be as fancy as an Amiga, but maybe a bit fancier than an IBM PC, just to kind of ballpark it. The, the microcontroller itself does not have any flash memory inside it. This is quite a clever design decision, because when you make flash memory out of silicon, the whole art of making a chip is you take a big slice of very specialized sand and then you curse it with magic chemicals and teach it how to do things. Um, the, the silicon processes you need for flash memory are different for the ones you need to make the processor and the rest. It's a very smart decision. They went, well, we just won't put the flash memory in. You just buy that separately and we'll join those up with some wires. It means if you need more flash memory, buy a different flash chip. Same processor. If you went to somewhere like ST Micro or um, one of the other many microcontroller manufacturers, they have five, six, eight different parts in the catalog, each with different amounts of flash memory. Um, I think it's fascinating. You look at the ST catalog, and it must be tens of thousands of line items in their catalog. Different microcontrollers with different performance and different amounts of flash. You go to the Raspberry Pi catalog and they're like, there's one thing in the catalog and you can either have one of them or 500 of them on a reel. Your choice. Really interesting. So what else do we have in the 2040? We have those serial and parallel interfaces. So if you could get yourself a terminal, you can plug one of those in and maybe that's what we need to make this into a computer. It also does all of the, the clock management, so all you need is a small crystal, um, and then that, the system will start up. So if we look at the specifications, in terms of uh, MIPS, we're at 120. I reckon that's, a, that's an estimate. So quite a lot more than the Amiga. <coughs> Nowhere near my MacBook, which was 200,000, you'll recall. In terms of input and output, well, we have serial interfaces. So I think to make this a computer, we're going to need to add some kind of terminal to give people text they can read and the ability to type. 
Storage, yes, we can also connect other kinds of disk drives. Can I run my code on it? And I think when you just get a Pico out of the box, you just buy it, you put it there, and you look at it, maybe plug the power in. So is it a computer? Well, no, because I need to program it. You know, out of the box, it just sits there and needs to be plugged in via USB so we can load some code onto it. So I say it's not a computer when you buy it, but I think you can make it a computer. And I think you can make it a computer by adding some hardware and adding some software. The third part of my talk. I have a project. It is called the Neotron Project. It, it came from an earlier project, which was called the Monotron. And the Monotron was named because the video it produced was only in one color. So I went with mono, and Tron just sounds cool. Uh, but it turns out there's already a Korg synthesizer with that name. So that might get slightly awkward. But I don't think there's anything else out there called the Neotron. But this is my project. And it is a, a family of computers. You know, these are home computers in that sort of 1980s sense. But they use ARM microcontrollers as their central processors. And why do I do this? Well. I love things like the RC2014. I think it's a great educational experience. It's just kind of hard to buy the chips because they're chips that have their roots in the 1970s and there's no great need to manufacture them, apart from the small number of hobbyists who want to build you know, 1970s style computers. So I wanted to make a, a line of computers that use modern chips that you can still buy today. And ARM microcontrollers seem to make sense. Maybe one day we'll have a RISC-V version of this platform. We'll use RISC-V microcontrollers. But for today, I think ARM is, ARM is where it's at. That's the best availability. Because if one of the chips becomes unavailable, I want people to be able to use another one instead. We've seen the great chip shortage. If you haven't heard, during the pandemic, there was a slight shortage of uh, computers. You may have noticed the Raspberry Pi been out of stock for, I think it was several years counting now, um, for various reasons we won't go into. But it's nice to be able to design a platform where people have a choice and then they can swap out the parts as they need. And the software for this family of computers is all written in the Rust programming language. That's what I teach, that's what I do, that's what I enjoy. And when I started, no one had really done anything of this scale in that language. They'd written web browsers, they'd written um, you know, all manner of network services, but I wanted to sort of push the boundaries of what you can do on Rust with microcontrollers. I wanted to know if it could be done, and the only way to find out was to do it. So I tried, and this is where we've ended up. The software is split into two pieces, like a classic IBM PC, or like the Altair before it, when it, was, uh, when it ran CPM, you have two parts. You have a BIOS, which talks to the machine and understands the details of the computer it's in. And then you have an operating system. And the operating system is sort of generic. The operating system could be run on a number of different computers, the same operating system, as long as they have a compatible BIOS implementation. I could take my MS-DOS floppy disk and I could boot my Amstrad and I could boot my IBM and I can boot a number of different machines that may have some different hardware, different amounts of memory, and it's the BIOS that hides all those differences. And I've gone for the same approach in my system. So if you made uh, one of these computers but used an ST chip, you would just write a new BIOS for your ST chip and your board design and then the operating system would be the same. And this is my goal. So this is taken from the, the website. I wanted something you could build out of modern chips, and I wanted to take advantage of modern software development tools like Rust, but I wanted a computer that was reduced to its fundamental elements, right? I wanted it to be small enough that you could understand. The Raspberry Pi is a great computer once the keyboard and screen has been plugged in, but it's, it's a bit too much for one person to understand. And I think that comes from the choice of the processor that's on it. 
that Broadcom silicon, a vastly powerful graphics processor, DSP. Um, if you could get the data sheet, the data sheet would be tens of thousands of pages long because it's just a very big chip. And if you wanted to make your own Raspberry Pi, I guess you can't get the chips. And if you can, what's it got, like 600 tiny balls underneath and you need to solder that to a PCB? That's, that's beyond, I think, the level of the average hobbyist. I mean, I've seen people try, which is quite interesting, but... So I wanted to make a computer that's much more simple, has fewer features, less performance, but is still enough. It's just enough to be a computer. So off-the-shelf production components. I wanted to make mine fully open source, so all the schematics are online, the PCB designs are online. If you look at the design and you think, that's nice, I just wish it was in pink, or I wish it had five slots instead of four, or I want to use a different processor. Just load the design into KiCad, delete the bits you don't want, you can change it. And then you should be able to assemble it yourself at home. I've tried really hard to find not 1970s style chips, which have the legs coming off the side, um, because they're kind of hard to get hold of now. But I, equally, I didn't want to use the, the very latest chips because I'll be honest, my eyesight's not what it once was, and I can't see them to solder them. They measure resistors in these various uh, sizes. So an 0805 resistor, I think it's measured probably in thousandths of an inch, but it's kind of, you know, I can, I can pick it up with tweezers. I can see it. 0402 gets sort of half the size. I'm starting to struggle. Modern computers, 0201 or half the size or half the size of that even. They just... Only a robot can pick those parts up. If you tip those resistors out onto a table, it would just look like fine dust. And really, you need a very high-precision robot to pick them up and lay them on the circuit board. So nothing too small, nice, chunky components so you can build it yourself. And I try and give you all the information you need so if you choose, you could understand the whole thing top to bottom from how you get the data sheet for the microcontroller, you can't get the, the underlying hardware design of the microcontroller. Maybe someone will make an open source microcontroller one day in the future where they publish all of the details and then you'll be able to go sort of even one level lower. You can have the PCB, you have the designs, you have all the source code for the BIOS and the OS. And for me, it has to be a computer. I have to be able to go up to it and program it. So this was my first version. So after the, the Monotron, which was sort of this is sort of demo prototype. I'm like, no, I'm going to do it properly. And I was using a Texas Instruments um, board there. The red board is a Texas Instruments Teva launch pad. The board, the red board, cost $25. And the processor on it, TI was selling for about $10. And this was what I designed it around. And I have joystick ports on the right-hand side. And I have MIDI ports on the left-hand side. I did some demos. You could plug in a keyboard. And this is, I was happy with this. It was a computer. You can plug in a keyboard and a screen and it makes video. And then, what was it, 2020, Raspberry Pi come along with that RP2040 and the Pico. So now the board itself is half the price of the chip by itself. I've got eight times as much RAM, twice the number of processors, and each of them runs twice as fast. It was just a slam dunk. As soon as it came out, I'm like, why? Why would, I, why would I use these TI boards anymore? It doesn't make any sense. So while I was redesigning, I thought, well, I'm going to make it a bit bigger. So it's now the same size as a PC mainboard. It's micro ATX sized. I thought, well, I've got all this room. I should probably have some expansion slots. Right, those early machines, they have expansion slots because not everything comes on the board. You want to, you know, add your own cards, add your own functionality. We've got the standard... Um, did that spec come out? It was 1997, 1999, I think. PC manufacturers decided that the audio sockets on your computer should be a specific color. Blue for line in, green for headphone output, and pink for microphone. Uh, and the video connector should be blue. And that's the standard. You still see that today. You can buy those connectors. Turns out AliExpress, you can just go and buy a box of like 100 triple audio jacks in the classic PC colors. You can get keyboard and mouse connectors. KiCad has drawn them in green over on the left-hand side, but that's green for the mouse and purple for the keyboard. 
Um, it designed a little power supply, a little audio system, an SD card slot, and then the Pico is there in grey. Can you get a coloured STL model for the Pico? If someone knows where I can get a 3D model of the Pico, but it's actually in colour instead of grey, let me know and I'll, I'll swap it out in the, in the design. So as I said, keyboard and mouse. I haven't written the mouse support yet. It's a work in progress. We can plug into VGA monitors. So this is a standard that came out in, I want to say 1987, 88. The IBM PS2 introduced the VGA video standard. It's been around a very long time, but it's still possible to get adapters. All right, I bet even that projector up there probably still has a VGA connector on the back of it. And VGA to HDMI is pretty, pretty straightforward. So it's a good video standard. It doesn't require um, an old fashioned TV. It's nice and high resolution. We can get it onto LCD displays. We use an SD card for storage, 16 bit stereo audio. And then we've got our four expansion slots. So is it a computer? Well, it's a work in progress, right? There's a roadmap to being a computer. Because what it can do at the moment, we can read from a keyboard and we can draw text on the screen. So like that terminal thing, done. That's, that's a well solved problem, got that. It can go beep, which is, you know, haven't written the stereo audio stuff yet, but there's a PC speaker. And well, technically it doesn't go beep. It tells the other microcontroller to go beep. There's another processor on the board that handles the reset, the power up. And I'd run out of pins on the Pico. I was using so many pins to do the video and the stereo audio, there was nothing left for the little PC speaker. So that got routed off to the second chip. And technically you can load applications. And I'll see if I can dig some pictures out later. Um, I have posted some pictures of me loading the first application on a Neotron Pico. I had to type the raw bytes in on the keyboard because the SD card doesn't work yet. So like the Altair, I had to load the data. One, and I'd say this address, store this data. But I only had to type in like, you know, I think it was like three lines of text. And it's fine. And it ran and it printed, hello world. So it is technically a computer. And as soon as the disk is, is fixed, I think we're gonna have a better time. Because we need, yeah, we need more. There's, there's more to do. So the SD card support, we need to be able to load applications from the SD card. And then we need a programming language. Again, it's not a computer unless you can program it. So answers on a postcard. What should my computer do? Should it boot to basic? like a Commodore or a BBC machine? Or should BASIC be an optional thing you can load? Should it be like a PC where it boots to some kind of operating system prompt and then you can choose whether you want BASIC or C or you know we could maybe have Python on there, that's been shown to fit. And it's a question I've struggled with and I'm not sure I've got a good answer yet. Should it boot to BASIC like a Commodore or should it boot to an operating system prompt like a sort of a more modern PC and then you can choose basic? I don't know. Come and see me later if you have opinions on this. I want to get the audio support working. I've tested it with uh, CircuitPython. So I've loaded a Python interpreter onto the board because it was the easiest way to, to drive the hardware. Somebody's written uh, I squared S audio for the RP2040 in Python. So I just loaded it, played a WAV file off the SD card. So the hardware has been tested. We just need more support in the operating system. And then expansion cards. I've made one. Um, <laughs> turns out the chip I put on it is now pretty much unavailable. Silicon shortage for you. I should have used an RP2040. Um, maybe that will be um, an option in the future. So we're pretty much at the end. We've got a few, time, uh, a few minutes for questions. Is the Pi Pico a computer? No, not out of the box. Can you turn it into a computer? Well, I think yes. And if anyone would like to see it, luckily for you, it's on display outside in the next room. So you come and try it for yourself. <coughs> if you'd like to find out more information, uh, there's all the information on the, on the GitHub website. You can look at hackaday.io. If you search on YouTube for Bill Hurd, he was an engineer at Commodore. He designed the Commodore 128 and the Commodore Plus 4, amongst other things. He invited me on his, uh, on his channel and we had you know, sort of a rambling two hour discussion about 
the computer and how it works. So go and check that out. And you can find me on Mastodon. That's all I've got for you. You've been a great audience. Thank you very much indeed. So we have another 15 minutes in this slot, and then there's a break, and then there'll be more talks and workshops. So if anyone has any questions, take them. A question. Can you connect it to the internet? Can you connect it to the internet? Maybe that is the modern definition of what is a computer. Um, out of the box, uh, no, because I used a Pico. You could plug in a Pico W, and then you would have Wi-Fi. You would just have to write code in the operating system to understand what Wi-Fi is and how to connect to the Wi-Fi. If you want a sense of how complicated that job is, Risk OS still can't do it. So, you know, Risk OS has been working on Wi-Fi support for some time. It's non-trivial. It can be done. You could also get, um, you can get an Ethernet chip from Wiznet. It has an SPI interface. So you could put one on a card and that would go in the expansion bus. And then you just send messages to it to say, hey, send an Ethernet packet, receive an Ethernet packet. Um, and I think that's probably where I'd go first. So not yet, perfectly possible. And yes, then in a modern sense, I guess that would feel more like a computer. Good question. Yes. You, you maybe just gave us a clue, but I was going to ask how the uh, expansion cards work. Are you using an existing standard? Did you make your own? Uh, yeah. So, th I mean, there isn't an there isn't an existing standard for how to plug cards into a microcontroller that's pretending to be a computer. There are some sort of microcontroller standards for expanding things. So. Um, Oh, as you see, Spark, Fun, various people have come up with different standards. There's the click bus, there's that micro bit, and there's that one that's an I squared C bus. But they're all kind of designed for people building robots and mechanical stuff. And it's sort of connectors you plug in. And I wanted something old fashioned. So I wanted card edge, cards go into a slot. So it's a card edge connector. You get an SPI bus with a unique chip select for every slot. You get a unique interrupt line for every slot. And for plug and play, there's an I squared C bus, and you put a little EEPROM on your card. And the computer can read the EEPROM separately in every slot. And then the idea is you put, put some information on the EEPROM, and it will tell the computer what you've just plugged in. So I plugged in an Ethernet adapter. Maybe we'll be like USB, right? Maybe we'll have vendor IDs and product IDs, you know, for all six computers that ever exist. If you want to make an expansion card, I can give you an ID. You can put it in the EEPROM. And then so that's how, that's how that system is designed to work. Programming yes. Scratch on an iPad counts as programming. It's programming. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yes, because you can invent some novel algorithm and you can get the computer to do input and output. So. Was that available early on? Did that not fall foul of Apple's sort of, you can't program on an iPad? Yeah. 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 I, I, Scratch is definitely a programming language. So absolutely. Yeah. You can make, yeah, you can do sound, you can do graphics, you can interface. So yeah, Scratch is definitely a programming language. So if you can do that, I think it's a computer. Yes. So the, the, the question for the, for the tape is, what format uh, is the software stored on the memory card for loading? Um, the previous versions of this machine, I've used a very simple format where it's basically just like a binary, like you would put in a microcontroller. But I put an extra couple of bytes at the beginning of the binary to say where the start function is. So it would just load it into memory read the first four bytes and go, oh, there's the start function, and it would jump to it. Since then, I have read some fascinating um, articles on how the ELF file format works, which is what Linux uses. So when you have a program on disk on a Raspberry Pi and you load it, that file is in the executable and linking format, ELF. And there's a bunch of information in there that says load these sections to these pieces of memory. You need to join them together with other programs on your system in this fashion. And here is the start function. And yeah, maybe I'm going to write an ELF loader. So you can just compile your programs as ELF, which is what comes out of your compiler naturally. Drop those straight on the card and load them. That's a bit more work.
but I think it's a bit more useful and you don't have to sort of do a conversion to turn them from sort of the standard format into my, into my special format. If you have suggestions on what the file extension should be, let me know. On Windows, it's .exe, and on Linux, they don't have a file extension. What should, what should Neotron binaries be? Should it be .neo, .nex? I don't know. Answers on a postcard. So and the second question. The second part, does Rust have an interpreter mode? Does Rust have an interpreter mode? No. Rust is a systems programming language that is designed to be compiled down to machine code to run on your microcontrollers or like the lowest level of your computer. People have built interpreters in Rust, but the Rust language does not lend itself to being typed on, a, on, a, on an interpreter like Python does. Um, so yeah, in terms of programming languages on there, it will be nice if there was something a bit like Python, but it was a bit more like basic. I have some ideas. Maybe there's something there. Okay. What, uh, do, do you have access to the features of the Pico uh, in this computer? Like, can I use the PIO or? Uh... Um, okay, so yeah. Can you use the various features of the chip? Y you can, uh, and there's no memory protection. So if you, run a, if you run an application, you have full access to the hardware. You can just stop the operating system, delete it from RAM, whatever you want. You can take full control. However, to do so would be non-portable. This was the plague of the IBM PC compatible, right? People wrote games and they wanted performance and they could ask MS-DOS to ask the BIOS to put something on the screen, but it was really slow. So they didn't. They went, well, I know what IBM PCs look like. The video memory lives here. I'm going straight into the video memory. And they bypassed the operating system and they bypassed the BIOS, which is fine for a game on that computer. But when someone else wanted to make a PC compatible, running DOS was no longer enough. You had to have exactly the same BIOS interface and you had to put your video memory at exactly the same place. There are some computers from history which are DOS compatible rather than PC compatible because they ran DOS, but the hardware wasn't laid out the same. It's fine for running Word, didn't work for games. So yes, you could access the, the features. I'm using two of the PIO uh, state machines to do the video and a third to use the audio, but sure, you can, you can take the hardware and do whatever you want with it, but you will break compatibility if I ever make a second one. Can I just make a comment about the, uh, the history aspect of this? Yes. Here? I mean, it, it's, to, to many people, it, it's ancient history there, but it's, it's not long ago. It's almost exactly 50 years ago that now I was a student here in Cambridge and I went to a, a lecture at the computer lab given by Fred Brooks, who was the guy who was brought in when the OS 360 operating system project was getting laid. Right. And he, he was a good speaker. He came in and stood at the front and said, not many people can proudly say that they have been in charge of what is generally believed to have been a multi-million dollar disaster. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was his starting point. But he, he, he if... If you haven't, he wrote a book called The Mythical Man Month, mm. and it's still a classic. Yeah. It's still worth reading now. But he, he was brought into a project that was running late, and he realized, the thing that other people hadn't, that adding people to a late project makes it later. <laughs> yes. So he took people away from the project. To speed it up. To speed it up. Interesting. And, and he had this thing also that there are aspects of it, you know, Two, two women can't produce a baby in less than nine months, you know, in, in four and a half months. Yep. There, are, there are things that... That, that just can't, things. yes. Yeah, no, so it's true. He was a fascinating speaker, and, and, you know, and it's, he's, he was still around until relatively recently, you know, so we've got that history. And the other is that my fingers, I think, still know the bootstrap pattern for a PDP-11. Right. <laughs> so all, all in there somewhere. 17640 deposit. 200 deposit, you know, because I did it every morning. That's how you turn the, yeah, how you turn the machine. I think it, I think it is a, it is a failure of education to present history as there were some dinosaurs and then the Tudors happened and then computers were invented because some of these things were, yeah, were a lot more recent than the others. And there's still, there's still interesting people you can go and talk to. And if no one's ever been to the Centre for Computing History in Cambridge, I'll finish with a plug. You should go. It's amazing. 
um, they have loads of great stories they've collected from people about these machines. So, all right, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much, everyone.